Welcome to the latest installment in a series of lectures on how popular culture misunderstands and misrepresents science and is therefore deserving of only our scornful disapproval. Today we turn our attention to that most fundamental of all biological theories, evolution. And we shall examine how evolution, one of the most powerful phenomena in the natural world, and the subject of the most important explanatory model in the life sciences, has been erroneously depicted throughout one of the most insidiously prolific and inexplicably beloved franchises in all of popular science fiction, emphasis on the fiction. The title of today's lecture, Star Trek Does Not Actually Understand Evolution. The sins, so to speak, of Star Trek when it comes to the depiction of evolution are many, and to explore them all in detail would require more time than I frankly feel the subject is worth. As one of the world's preeminent science educators, as well as a leading voice in the skeptic community, I have better things to do with my time, such as using my influence to quietly blackball feminists from secular conferences and appearing on podcasts hosted by accused sex criminals, thus leveraging my celebrity and impressive scientific credentials to legitimize the horrid views of misogynists whom I claim to despise and defend and normalize people who represent a literal danger to others, which I am happy to disregard so long as they agree with me that cathedral bells sound nicer than Muslim calls to prayer. Also science. I do do science. Or oh, rather, I do undertake science. When I say I do do science, it creates a scatological impression in the mind which I should think is best avoided. What was I saying? Yes, Star Trek and evolution. To assist us in our examination of this unifying theory of biology and how this lowbrow television show with its scientific illiteracy and feel-good politically correct poppycock has bollocksed it up, I have enlisted the unwitting assistance of a YouTuber who, to his lasting disrepute, has chosen as his vocation the analysis and, so far as such a thing is possible, the illumination of various topics related to Star Trek. He has titled this project Trek Actually, and it was only yesterday as I was watching one of his videos in preparation for this very lecture that I realized with a twinge of horror and no small amount of embarrassment for the poor fellow that he was trying to be funny. Nevertheless, however cringe-inducing his misguided attempts at humor may be to men of... Just a moment. I don't think we have any... No, just as I thought. To men of science, such as ourselves, the most recent installment of his series is on the subject of Star Trek's incorporation of evolutionary concepts into its puerile narratives. This presenter does a fair job of identifying the various misrepresentations and distortions of evolutionary theory throughout Star Trek, 
though unfortunately he is also a shameless and contemptible apologist for same. So consider yourselves fairly warned. Now, if you please, Peebo, let us have the first video clip. So, if we're going to talk about evolution in Star Trek, the first thing I need to establish is what we are going to focus on and what we aren't. We aren't going to focus on irregularities or mistakes that we might notice, but which are just sort of part of the whole Star Trek deal. Like how almost all of the alien species are basically humans with some shit on their forehead. The TNG episode The Chase attempted to explain this, having the Enterprise crew, along with some Klingons, Cardassians, and Romulans, discover evidence that an ancient humanoid race had seeded its genetic material on many other planets, meaning humans and all these Star Trek aliens had come from common ancestors. That raises just as many questions as it answers, doesn't really make sense from an evolutionary perspective, and doesn't explain the many alien species we've seen who look exactly like humans, with no shit on their foreheads or anything, or why individuals from different species that evolved on separate planets can produce offspring together. But hey, it's Star Trek, what are you gonna do? Instead, we're going to focus on instances where Star Trek has explicitly referred to evolution, sought to depict it, or cited it as an explanation for something that happens in the episode, and gotten it wrong. There are many episodes featuring such instances. I mentioned one already in a previous episode of this series, the Dear Doctor episode of Enterprise where Dr. Phlox seems to believe, contrary to the actual science, that evolution has a predetermined outcome and that it's worth allowing people to die of a genetic disease rather than risk altering that outcome. But for me, there are two major offenders that stand head and shoulders above the others. Two episodes that are not only examples of Star Trek getting evolution completely wrong, but which also happen to be two of the worst overall episodes in the franchise. The first of those is an episode from the seventh season of Star Trek The Next Generation, titled Genesis. So Worf is testing out a new torpedo guidance system by shooting at an asteroid field. One of the torpedoes goes haywire and flies wildly off course. The torpedo can't be remotely disarmed because too many asteroids, so Picard is like, Data, why don't you, the third most important officer on the ship, and me, the first most important officer on the ship, take a shuttlecraft out to grab that stray torpedo? And Data's like, that sounds like a perfectly reasonable suggestion. Let's us, the captain and second officer of the number one ship in the fleet, go do that right now. So Picard and Data take a shuttle out to find the lost torpedo. While they're gone, some strange shit starts to happen. Like, Worf starts acting all moody and short-tempered. And Barkley is really nervous. Weird, right? Anyway, Troy's been complaining about the temperature, so she goes to her quarters and takes a hot bath with her uniform on, like you do. Worf shows up for a booty call, and Troy's like, not now, I'm cold and thirsty. So Worf is like, cool, I'll just bite you and take off. Later, Worf and Troy are in sick bay, and Dr. Crusher and Nurse Ogawa are talking about how people all over the ship are reporting unusual symptoms, complaining about the temperature, coming down with fevers. Crusher's like, sounds like something's going around. Let me talk to Worf, try to figure out what it is. And Crusher goes up to Worf and goes, so what was all that about with you and Troy? How come you bit it and quit it? And then Worf sprays acid in her face. Ogawa gets Crusher into stasis before too much damage is done, but she tells Commander Riker that they still can't figure out what's making everyone feel bad and act funny. Barkley says that they've been finding Worf's acid venom all over the ship, and Geordi says, oh yeah, also, Worf is missing and security can't find him, and he's not showing up on sensors for some reason, so that's also a thing. Riker tries to call Starfleet for help, but forgets the number. Three days later, Picard and Data come back from their torpedo hunt. Jesus, did it really get that far away in a few minutes? Did it fall through a wormhole? Was it hiding? Or was Picard dragging his feet because he just liked being out of the office? You know how you're only supposed to take an hour for lunch, but sometimes you stretch it a little and don't come back for three days? 
Anyway, they find the Enterprise just kind of drifting with the lights off. They go aboard, and Data is getting some strange life sign readings. He's detecting a bunch of animals instead of the crew. They decide to go find the other senior officers, and they start with Troy. They get to her quarters, and Troy is back in the bathtub like we saw her earlier, but now she's got gills on her neck. Picard's like, I'm beginning to think something's wrong here. They go to the bridge, where they discover a dead ensign with a fractured spine. They enter the captain's ready room, where they find Riker, who seems his usual self. They take Riker and Troy to sick bay. Data looks him over. Then he says to Picard, so here's what's happening. The crew is de-evolving. Picard's like, okay. Data explains that a synthetic T-cell has entered everyone's genetic code and activated their introns, which are obsolete DNA sequences that used to be responsible for certain characteristics in our ancestors billions of years ago, but are no longer used. That's why Troy has gills, because her species evolved from amphibious animals. Picard's like, yeah, de-evolving. I got it the first time. They look around the ship some more. Data's cat, who, as of this episode, is suddenly female and pregnant, has de-evolved into an iguana, but given birth to a normal litter of kittens. That's odd. I'm sure that won't come up again later. Then, in engineering, they find Barkley, who has de-evolved into... a spider? Sort of? Eh. He's more of a spider than Gary from Horrors of Spider Island, at least. Anyway, Data figures out a way to cure the crew, to re-evolve them, if you will, using a retrovirus made from amniotic fluid. He got the idea from Lizard Spot's kittens, so I guess that did wind up being important. Who would have thought? Data finds the cure just in time, because Worf has de-evolved into Doomsday or something, and he's right outside ready to do unspeakable things to Troy. Data gives Picard a hypo spray full of pheromones and tells him to go into the corridor and distract Worf so he can get some goddamn work done. While Worf is chasing Picard, Data completes the cure and releases it into the ship's air supply, and pretty soon everybody's back to normal. Later, Barkley's in sickbay asking Crusher what the hell just happened, and Crusher explains, Oh, so you remember when I treated you for the flu in that early scene Steve forgot to talk about? Well, it turns out it accidentally activated all your dormant T-cells and turned into a virus that infected the crew. Whoopsie! Anyway, I'm gonna name the de-evolution disease after you. Sound cool? So yeah, there's a lot wrong with this episode. In terms of how it depicts evolution, one of the most immediately obvious problems is that even if a virus that caused people to acquire characteristics of their distant evolutionary ancestors could exist, it wouldn't cause a human like Barkley to turn into a spider monster because, you know, Humans didn't evolve from spiders. We do share a common ancestor with spiders, but it's the same common ancestor we share with every other arthropod. It lived around 600 million years ago and was probably a worm-like creature. Humans and spiders do have DNA in common. It's just not the spidery bits. Those appeared after our evolutionary paths had already diverged. There are other reasons why the writers of Star Trek The Next Generation might have wanted Barkley to de-evolve into a spider. For example, in an earlier episode, Realm of Fear, Chief O'Brien confides that he used to be deathly afraid of spiders, and Barkley says that spiders never really bothered him. Maybe now we know why. Because Barkley is part spider. Whether you think this is an acceptable justification for having Barkley de-evolve into a spider is a matter of taste. Personally, it feels like a long way to go for not much of a payoff. I mean, is a labored inside joke that some in your audience will find confusing or off-putting and most won't even get really worth the effort? Just a moment. I'm approvingly retweeting someone who says Islam is worse than Nazism. There we are. Now then, the YouTube presenter is correct. The Star Trek episode in question misrepresents evolution in numerous ways. Perhaps most egregiously, it makes use of legitimate scientific terms, but distorts or, in some cases, discards entirely their proper definition in order that they may serve a designated purpose within the narrative. For example, you heard during that clip the term intron. 
introns are real things. To put it in simple terms, any lay person could understand introns are nucleotide sequences removed via RNA splicing during the post-transcriptional modification process. They do not contain ancestral DNA. They would not produce vestigial traits if somehow activated, whatever that is supposed to mean. And as the presenter points out, even if that were somehow possible, it would not result in a human being acquiring the characteristics of a spider because human beings did not evolve from spiders. I would also object to the use of the term de-evolution, which suggests the phenomenon being depicted is a form of evolution, or at the very least a process similar to evolution. Nothing could be further from the truth for the simple fact that the so-called de-evolution affliction affects individuals while evolution does not operate within a single generation, but across many generations. There is, in legitimate biological science, a concept known as devolution, but this is merely the notion that a species may revert to a previous form. Such a reversion, if that is even the proper word, would be due to adaptation shaped by the pressures of natural selection, just the same as any other result produced by evolution, and would occur through gradual changes realized over multiple generations, just like any other product of evolution. And now, uh, Peebo, I believe we have another segment of this fellow's YouTube video. Let us turn our attention to that. As bad as Genesis is, and as wrong as it gets evolution, there's another episode in the franchise that is even worse, and somehow manages to get evolution way, way wronger. It's not an episode of TNG. It's an episode of Voyager. It's from the second season. And it's called Threshold. So it turns out, for the past few months, Tom Paris, Bellana Torres, and Harry Kim have been spending their free time trying to break Warp 10. In case you're not hip to the importance of Warp 10, Warp 10 is to the Star Trek universe as the speed of light is to us in the real world. It's the universal speed limit. Nothing can travel at Warp 10 or faster. But if you could travel that fast, you could go pretty much anywhere in the universe in no time at all. So it makes sense that officers on a ship stranded 70,000 light years from home would make retrofitting a shuttlecraft to travel that speed their weekend project. Star Trek solved the problem of faster than light travel by inventing subspace and explaining that ships are able to travel through it at many times the speed of light. But how do Paris, Torres, and Kim solve the problem of how to fly faster than warp 10? They discover a new kind of dilithium that remains stable at higher speeds. Oh, okay, so warp 10 isn't completely analogous to the speed of light? There's no law of physics preventing you from going that fast? It's more of a mechanical puzzle to be solved? Like the speed of sound? You just need a ship that'll hold up to the strain, you need a form of fuel that'll give you enough power? Okay. Except... In this episode, they also talk about how warp 10 is infinite velocity, and a ship traveling at warp 10 would occupy every point in the universe simultaneously. So there is something special about that particular speed. It's not merely faster than we've been able to go so far. And yet, Paris, Torres, and Kim are able to reach that unattainable speed by finding a new form of dilithium. That's like suggesting a vessel here in the real world could fly at the speed of light if only we could invent a form of rocket fuel that burned hot enough. Spoiler alert, that wouldn't work. Anyway, sorry, 
let's get to the evolution stuff. So Tom Paris flies their experimental shuttlecraft at warp 10. The shuttle disappears for a minute, but then it shows back up with a computer full of sensor information that, according to Torres, describes literally every cubic centimeter in this sector. Don't expect that to ever be mentioned again. But hey, good for Tom. He's the Chuck Yeager of the 24th century. But uh-oh, he's dead. Wait, no he's not. He's alive. The doctor examines him and he's like, oh, look at that, you grew an extra heart. Tom starts mutating. His tongue falls out, he goes through kind of a rotting corpse phase, then turns into a lizard-like creature. Eventually, he breaks out of sickbay, abducts Captain Janeway, takes her aboard the experimental shuttlecraft, and flies away at warp 10 again. While the rest of the crew looks for the stolen Warp 10 shuttle, the Doctor explains to Chakotay and Tuvok that traveling at the infinite velocity of Warp 10 accelerated the natural course of evolution, and that Paris's mutated form is possibly a future stage of human development. Just... just hold on to that for a second. The episode's almost over. They locate the Warp 10 shuttle and orbit over a planet somewhere. Chakotay and Tuvok beam down and find Paris and Janeway both having evolved, and I'm putting evolved in quotes there in case I didn't put enough stank on it just now for you to tell, evolved into giant salamanders. And they had babies! Chakotay and Tuvok take Paris and Janeway back to Voyager. The doctor uses anti-proton therapy to revert them back to their normal human forms, because not only can you accelerate evolution, you can also just wind it right back, apparently. And Janeway makes a joke about how she's thought about having kids, but she never thought about having them with Tom. Did you think about abandoning them on a remote planet? Because those salamander babies are dead. Everybody gets that, right? They fled into the water because they were scared, but look how small they were. They still needed their parents. And Chakotay and Tuvok beamed their parents away, and when they returned to their human forms, neither one of them was like, hey, let's go back and get our babies. And now they're dead! Of course, I didn't know it at the time I first saw this episode, but... After watching Star Trek Voyager for five more years, I came to realize that those dead salamander babies were the lucky ones. Peebo, it was right here. You're certain you haven't seen it. And that is the truth. I shall be greatly vexed if that is not the case. Now then, as the adult-minded webcam jockey said, the explanation offered for the transformation of the helmsman and later also the captain of the starship Voyager is that traveling at infinite velocity somehow caused them to undergo an accelerated process of evolution. While it is conceivable that traveling at a hitherto unattainable speed might trigger mutations in much the same way as exposure to radiation, it is simply not plausible to suggest that these mutations would proceed in a way that is analogous to evolution, much less worthy of being described as an expedited but otherwise natural form of evolution itself. Evolution, it cannot be overstated, operates from generation to generation, not within a single generation. This fact alone rules out evolution as an explanation for the transformations experienced by the characters in the Star Trek Voyager episode. Species evolve. Individuals do not evolve biologically. Upper class white male individuals, such as myself, do not evolve socially or morally either, which is just as well as there is no need. We are fine just the way we are, and anyone who says otherwise is an overly sensitive busybody who fails to realize how good they've got it. But even if it were the case that evolution could be accelerated in some way so as to produce significant physical changes in an individual over a short period of time, there is still 
natural selection to consider. Natural selection shapes the course of evolution by, in essence, favoring or selecting for traits which confer an advantage. It is in this way that successful species evolve to become well adapted to the environment in which they live. This being the case, what possible reason would there be for a human being, surely already ideally suited for life aboard a spaceship which was designed and built by human and humanoid beings, to evolve into a quadrupedal amphibious creature seemingly best suited to an equatorial jungle. Why would natural selection, operating in the environment of a spaceship, guide a human being to evolve into a beast utterly incapable of functioning effectively in its environment? For further commentary, we turn for the last time to our YouTube presenter, who demonstrates in the following passage the truth of the old adage that on occasion even a blind cave fish is able to locate an aquatic worm. Peebo, if you please. But of all the ways that Threshold gets evolution wrong, having it happen to one person rather than multiple generations of people, having a person living aboard a starship evolve into a four-legged amphibious animal that crawls around on its belly, this next one is the most outrageous, dipshittiest of them all. One of the fundamental things that needs to happen for evolution to work is for organisms to reproduce. If an organism doesn't reproduce, it doesn't pass its genes on to another generation, and evolution can't happen. But organisms can't reproduce unless they survive long enough to do so. How is it then, if Tom's condition is a result of an accelerated but otherwise natural evolutionary process, that in the early stages of his transformation, he dies? And shortly before he dies, his lungs become unable to process oxygen, and he develops an allergy to water. So, according to the doctor, who is a hologram programmed with, like, all the medical knowledge, Tom Paris's ultimate form is a future stage of human development, a stage which humans will reach after developing life-threatening allergies to water and losing the ability to breathe oxygen. And by the way, in case you forgot, as the writers of this episode apparently did, humans are native to this planet. You see all that blue stuff? That's water. Here's a view from the surface. See all that blue stuff? That's the atmosphere. It's full of oxygen. You might be saying, but wait, Tom only dies for a couple of hours. When he comes back to life, he seems like he's breathing fine. Sure, but remember, the doctor says Tom's mutations are following the natural pattern of human evolution. So, how are humans supposed to evolve into whatever Tom is after he comes back to life? Never mind the giant salamander thing if, before we get to that stage, we have to evolve into a creature that can't drink water or breathe oxygen on a planet that's packed with both. Sure seems like an organism with a mutation that prevents it from processing water or oxygen that was born on a planet rich with water and oxygen wouldn't live long enough to reproduce, meaning its existence as a species would end after a single generation, leaving no offspring behind, meaning it wouldn't evolve into shit. Unfortunate as his typically crude American dialect may be, he does make the point. As mentioned previously, the explanation offered by the Doctor character is that these salamander creatures are examples of a future stage of human evolutionary development. The Doctor's explanation would only be acceptable if evolution proceeded toward a predetermined end, if humans were somehow destined to evolve into these salamander creatures. But this is utter nonsense. The mechanisms of evolution are random mutation and 
natural selection. Predestination is not a mechanism of evolution. Mother Nature is not a Calvinist. Well, I believe I have demonstrated with the inadvertent assistance of this hapless YouTube presenter that Star Trek is a nightmare of pseudoscience and baseless fantasy, and no one should watch it ever for any reason. Please join me for the next installment in our series, where the subject will be the 2016 Ghostbusters film, which is preposterous for two reasons. One, ghosts do not exist, and two, if they did, no woman would be clever enough to catch one. Until then, this concludes our presentation. On an unrelated note, is anyone aware of what has become of my pocket telephone? Hey folks, well, that's the video about how Star Trek handles evolution. It sure felt good to get all those Richard Dawkins jokes off my chest. I uh, hope you enjoyed that one. Hope it uh, scratched whatever itch you may have had. Whether you wanted to just see someone examine how Star Trek treats evolution, or you felt a random urge to see someone mock a popular and extremely problematic scientist and science educator. Uh, I, I hope that did it for you. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next proper Regulation Trek Actually video is going to be about in just a second. But first, time for some shout outs to some of my wonderful Patreon patrons. These are folks who have joined my Patreon campaign at the level of $5 or more per month since the last Regulation Trek Actually video. And their names are Marcus Siegemund. Thank you, Marcus. Matthew Reuker, thank you, Matthew. Rick Dance, thank you, Rick. Josh Reed, thank you, Josh. Jonathan Peden, thank you, Jonathan. Jeff Richards, thank you, Jeff. Fab, thank you, Fab. Avilus Saliva, thank you, Avilus. Python 4.0, thank you, Python 4.0. Rocky Gregory, thank you, Rocky. Ben Douglas, thank you, Ben, and Adam Brummage, thank you, Adam. Thanks to all of you who are my Patreon patrons. At whatever level you are pledging, however long you have been supporting my work here on YouTube, you can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives to become a patron of this channel for as little as $1 a month, but $5 a month or more gets you a shout out at the end of Trek, actually, just like those folks. And also a pledge of any amount gives you access to the polls that I post on my Patreon page every month that uh, determine what future topics I will address on Trek Actually videos. And the poll for the January video is going up today, the same day that this video goes live. So if you are a patron or thinking of becoming a patron of mine, uh, at noon Eastern today, the day that this video goes up, you will get the poll for the January Trek Actually video. And you can go and you can vote for that. Uh, and help to choose what that January topic will be. Before I get to what the December topic will be, I want to plug the Ensign's Log, which is the Star Trek-themed comedy podcast that I co-host along with the brilliant and hilarious Jason Harding, where Jason and I play uh, characters. We play low-ranking officers serving aboard a certain legendary Federation starship as it carries out a certain historic five-year mission. I think you can see where I'm going with this. Uh, all of our episodes take place roughly within the same time period of a classic Trek episode. Sometimes it ties in directly with the events of the episode. Sometimes the episode is just kind of going on in the background while Jason and I are doing our own thing, but it's such a fun show. If you really dig the Star Trek stuff that I do on this channel, I think you'll really like the Ensign's Log. It's a blast. We have a great time doing it, and people who listen to it seem to have a great time listening to it. So if you haven't heard it, 
Uh, you can go to the links in the description of the video. You can listen on SoundCloud. You can listen on the website. You can subscribe via RSS using your favorite podcast app and check out the Ensign's Log if you have not checked it out yet. Now then, for the final regulation Trek Actually video of the year, December's Trek Actually video, you folks, you patrons who voted in the last poll, have chosen to, I think, to, to give us all a little bit of a, of a holiday present. Because it's a video that I've been wanting to do, and, and uh, I know it's a video that a lot of you have wanted me to do as well, because this most recent poll was the first poll where this topic was available. And it won first time out. It was a first ballot poll winner, which is very impressive. So the subject of December's Trek Actually video, regulation Trek Actually video, will be the completion of my epic Cardassian trilogy. I've already done a video about Dukat. I did a video earlier this year about Garrick. And now in December, I will complete the trilogy by looking at the other important Cardassian in Star Trek Deep Space Nine as we examine the character of Damar, one of the most requested subjects. Actually, ever since I did the Garrick video, I think Damar has jumped up and become the most requested video subject uh, for this series. So in December, in just a few short weeks, I will do the Damar video and it will be on the question, is Damar actually Star Trek's good Nazi? Damar has many of the hallmarks of a, of a typical good Nazi character. He has a very interesting character arc that takes him throughout the series, travels a lot of distance in terms of character development from his first appearance as basically a glorified extra all the way to the end where he becomes an incredibly important character to the series and, and to the Star Trek universe in general. So it's going to be a lot of fun examining Damar and trying to figure out what do we do with him? Does he redeem himself? Is he a good Nazi? Is there such a thing as a good Nazi? Should that even be a term that we use? It'll be a really interesting video, a really fun video. I hope you will come back and join me for the Damar video next month. There will probably be at least one, maybe two, not actually Trek Actuallys put in there in between now and the Damar video. So come back for those as well. Hope you enjoyed the evolution video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.